Hi, welcome to Happy Now, a channel dedicated to the pursuit of happiness. Because you don't have to wait, you can be happy now. I'm Olivia. Today I'm going to be talking about myself. <laughs> it's so important to know who you are, what you want, and where you came from. By understanding how your past has shaped you, you can work to become the best version of yourself. A lot of people escape their past, avoid it, repress it, ignore it. But doing so only takes them further and further away from being happy now. Looking in the mirror is truly the only way to put the pieces of your life back together. So let me share some of my life with you. I was born in New Delhi in a little hospital in 1984 to a young Indian mother and a Peruvian father. Now, my parents' lives in and, of them, in and of themselves are sagas, but I'll just say that my mom was escaping her circumstances, and she was 20 years old. My father was a 36-year-old Peruvian diplomat posted in India, and in his own way, he was ex escaping his own circumstances. He really wanted to have a family. So they got married, and they had me. My mom pushed once, and then the doctor didn't say anything, and she pushed again with all her, all her might, and I shot out of there, and the doctor caught my head, head inches from the ground. So right there, not even 10 seconds of life, and I dodged that bullet. She held me, and then she told the nurses to take me away because she was exhausted and overwhelmed. She always tells me that when she saw me the next day, she fell in love. Then 18 months later, they had my sister, and when I was about two years old, we moved to Peru. Now, after my sister was born, my mom had postpartum depression. She didn't know it then, we know now because of awareness. She also had anxiety from relocating to another continent and because her marriage with my father was basically over. Back in India, he had told her, you're not taking my kids away from me, you can stay in India, but I'm going to Peru and I'm taking them. And she thought, you're, not you're taking my kids away from me over my dead body. By the way, her mother abandoned her. So my mom went to Peru. And back in India, she, she had been more than halfway done with a degree in Spanish honors. When my father told her, you don't need a crappy degree from an Indian university. You can, you can go to school anywhere in the world. You're my wife. You know, quit. And my mom said, okay. <laughs> and by the time she realized that was a mistake, it was too late in India. So in Peru, she tried again. She started to go to college, but she, she was getting a degree for interpretation and translation because they did not have Spanish honors. So she had to start from scratch. Now, when we came to Peru, we were building a house, but it wasn't ready. So we stayed with my father's mother in an apartment he was paying for. My father's family was not kind to my mother. In fact, my grandmother went out of her way to make my mom's life harder. My dad only gave her enough money for the bus fare to get to college. Sometimes she would take us with her. She would take us with her when she didn't have, when nobody else could watch us. I remember being dragged by the hand, my sister, she was carrying my sister. One time, I was sitting in a class, in her class, and she was giving this presentation for like 15 minutes. And when it's over, I, l I look at her colleague and I say, why is my mom talking to herself? <laughs> About a year later, our preschool calls her. And my mom goes in and is the principal and our teacher and the school psychologist. And they hand her a drawing of the family unit my sister had done. And where my sister was supposed to draw the mother, she hadn't drawn my mother. She had drawn one of our caretakers. And my mom said, what is this? And they said, well, your children seem to be confused as to who their mother is. My mother said, well, I'm getting a degree so that I can get a job so that I can support them. I change their nappies. I bathe them. I feed them. I put them to bed. I'm their mother. And they said, your children are very confused. And this is a crucial emotional and mental developmental time for them. And if it continues this way, the negative repercussions are going to affect them their whole lives. And my mom was devastated. 
She thought, I didn't bring these kids into the world to mess them up more. So she quit to stay at home. Now, unfortunately, my mom was like a painting. She was always there, but never emotionally engaged. But a year after that, my father kind of went out of the picture. Um, I was about five years old. My sister was three and a half. And he went to Los Angeles to work. All we knew is that we got to go to Los Angeles and visit him and go to Disneyland. But in Disneyland, he was so tired he had to use a wheelchair. About a year after that, he came back to Peru. And he was so sick he had to sleep in the study downstairs. He couldn't go up the stairs. And I remember one time I heard a noise and I tiptoed downstairs and I hid behind some furniture. He had tried to go to the bathroom and fall in. And he rang his bell and my mom rushed downstairs and she said, why didn't you ring the bell before? And he said, I thought I could do it alone. And she said, well, you can't. And I watched as my mother's youth ebbed away, carrying my father in her arms. Sometime after that, one day we, we said goodbye to my father. We went to school and we came back and he was gone. He'd gone to the hospital and we weren't allowed to see him, visit him. And then one day my mom came home with a tub of ice cream, our favorite. And as we were eating spoonfuls of ice cream, she said, your dad is gone. He, he passed away. He died. He's gone to heaven. And I remember she had a teak lacquered box with his ashes, all that was left of him. And we sprinkled some at the base of a rose bush. I don't remember much else from this time period. I, I barely remember anything before I was eight years old. So my mom was 31 years old, widow, with two young girls, and she didn't have a job. And she had a constant migraine for weeks and I remember there were a panoply of anti-anxiety medications on her night table and we had to shake her awake to take us to school. To, and um, one day the head of the foreign office called her. Now my father worked for 23 years for the foreign office of Peru as a diplomat, just shy of the 25 year full pension mark. And when he was in Los Angeles, the health insurance company that insured the Foreign Office of Peru was renewing their contract. And when they did, they left seven sick diplomats out of that contract because the premiums were too high. And my father was one of those seven diplomats. So after 23 years of service, he came back to Peru without health insurance to die in a public hospital. So my mother goes to see the head of the foreign office and he says, Senora, I am so sorry for what happened. I can't do anything about that, but we have created a translator and interpreter job for you. I hope you take it. My mom took it and her migraine stopped and life kind of went on routine for a while. And then when I was 10 years old, this young diplomat started courting her and wouldn't leave her alone. He, he bought me stickers for my 1994 World Cup album. He took us to Burger King and he brought home Elvis movies to watch on the weekends. And then he got posted to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And next thing I know, my mom goes to visit him and she comes back and she says, I'm gonna marry him, we're gonna move to Brazil and you're gonna go to an American school called Chapel. And I said, Ma, we don't know English. <laughs> And she said, you're going to learn. And I said, why? Because the world runs in English. Okay. Actually, about the only time my mom spent was with us was at night. She used to sing us six to eight songs each from a repertoire of songs she learned when she was a little girl in her Catholic convent school in India. The Sound of Music and the Indian National Anthem. So my sister's English consist my sister's English and mine consisted of phrases like crisp apple strudels and whiskers on kittens. <laughs> Other than that, we didn't know anything else. 
I didn't want to move to Brazil. I didn't want to disrupt the precarious balance that we had created. It was always the three of us. There was no room for a fourth, even if he bought us Burger King. But we moved to Brazil, and my mom put us in a preparatory academy to learn English for six months. I remember trying to read my first book in English, The Hardy Boys, The Disappearing Floor. And I open to the first page and the words are like hieroglyphs. And I slam the book and I throw it across the room. And my mom has like antenna. So she rushes in and she, sa and she picks up the book and she says, you don't ever throw a book on the floor. That's a sin in my country. By the time I was your age, I had read hundreds of books. You haven't even read one. Here's a dictionary. You're gonna look up each and every single word you don't know until you know it. Well, my sister and I passed the chapel entrance exam. She went to fourth grade and I went to fifth grade. Life at home was not very good. My stepfather was always demanding praise and attention. He recriminated us for the money that he spent on us. And to pay for chapel, my mom was using the rent money from our house from Peru. And she was traveling all over Sao Paulo teaching businessmen English. And they used to have a lot of fights. And most of them were about me. <laughs> it turns out my stepfather said I wasn't behaving like a proper daughter. So one day my mom grabs me by the arm and drags me downstairs to the study. And she says, you're gonna start behaving right now. And I said, why? He's not my father. And she said, yeah, your father is dead. And you know what he died of? Yeah, cancer? No, he was gay and he died of AIDS and he left us all alone. AIDS. This was 1994. AIDS was not known the way it is today. But I knew it was bad. Otherwise, why were we lying to people and telling them he died of cancer? Gay. I knew that was bad. In, in South America, all I knew were derogatory terms paired with men, and there was a lot of shame attached to that word. There was a lot of shame attached to both of those words. So I filed it away somewhere in my 10-year-old brain, and I focused on school. I figured out that my teacher paid me attention if I did well. So I did my homework with the utmost care and detail. I raised my hand more than anyone. I did more book reports than anyone. And before I knew it, six months later, I was fluent in English. One morning, my stepfather and my mom are having a screaming match. And for once, it's not about me. See, my sister had a different approach to the neglect we were surrounded with. She didn't do any of her homework. <laughs> so my mom drags us downstairs by the arm to the patio. And I said, I don't have to listen to this. I, get, I got A's and B's. And I stand up and she says, sit the heck back down. So I sat next to my sister. And my mom looks at her with dagger-like eyes. And she says, your stepfather wants to take you out of chapel, put you in a Portuguese public school, and use the money to go on vacation. But you know why I'm never going to let that happen? Because I'm never going to let you give me the excuse that you failed in life because I didn't give you what I gave your sister. I am working day and night to give you an education so that you don't have to depend on anyone the way I do. And you're not going to make this harder than it has to be for me. And she looked at both of us and she said, do you know what Harvard and Yale are? Muted head shakes. They are the best universities in America. I don't have any money to send you there, but all the money in the world won't get you in if you're stupid. You have to develop study habits now. And now she looked at my sister again and she said, whether you want to become a president or a prostitute <laughs> or a receptionist is up to you. It's your choice, but you're not going to blame me for the choices that you make. And
And she said, now I'm gonna get up and go to work across town so that I can pay for your school so that you can get C's and D's. And she left. And my sister and I never got anything other than an A ever again. <laughs> when, when I was, so trouble followed my stepfather to work, not just home. He, he got in trouble and he got posted to Bucharest, Romania. And he said, he took it, my mom's furniture, her Indian furniture, her Peruvian furniture, and he said, I'm going to wait for you with open arms. And we stayed back because we still had to finish out the year, and we stayed in a farm on the outskirts of the city, a friend's farm, because he didn't want to pay rent in two places. So we had to drive an hour and a half at dawn to get to school and back in the evening. And... Let me go back a little bit. When, when my father died, the doctor told her to get pets because so we could put our half-orphan love somewhere. And so one day my mom comes home with this furry thing in the steering wheel, by the steering wheel. And my sister and I are upstairs through the balcony. We can see, so we rush downstairs. And she says, this is Melchiades. He's the Siamese. And I look at him and I snatch it from her and I said, he's mine. And she looks at us horrified. She says, I'm going to the market right now to get his brother. And she came back two hours later with his brother and she said, this is Arcadio. He's a Siamese like his brother. And my sister snatched him and she said, he's mine. And they had black little paws and black tails and black ears and a black snout that looked like it had been dipped in hot chocolate fondue. So when we went to Brazil, we took our cats. And when we went to the farm, a couple of months later, Melchiades disappeared. And after two weeks, the caretaker of the farm said that he drowned and that he'd buried him somewhere and that he thought it was best that we didn't know. So his brother wandered aimlessly up and down the farm looking for him. And my sister climbed the trees and nestled in their branches for hours. And I sat by the lake and wondered where the heck I was gonna put my half orphan love now that my prescription cat was dead. And so we moved to Bucharest, Romania. And Romania was recovering from a, post, from a socialist dictatorship, trying to rebuild itself and find its identity, much like us. My mom put us at the American School of Bucharest. Back in chapel, my teacher had said that I had above average intelligence and maturity and that I should skip sixth grade and go to seventh grade. So at the American School of Bucharest, ASB, the counselor agreed and I went to seventh grade. My sister went to fifth grade. And we focused on school again, life at home, was miserable. It took my stepfather a few weeks after he said he was waiting for us with open arms to tell my mom that he had been cheating on her with every woman he could get his hands on since before they were married. And he said that she was a fat cow who needed to get her fat behind and work. By the way, my mom was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. And to pay for the American School of Bucharest, she was using the rent money from our house in Peru again, and she was working as a tutor in the school. So their marriage was basically over. We moved to an apartment in the same, on the same floor that he had rented when his parents came to visit. And he said he, he stopped paying for everything but rent. He said, figure out a way to take your kids to school because my driver's not taking them anymore. We got used to stale bread and salami, and pasta and red sauce. Sometimes he had ground pork in it when his maid could smuggle some for us. And one day, my sister and I were ready to go to school. 
and my mom is tucked under under 10 blankets in her bed and she says I'm sick I'm not taking you to school I'm not taking you to school today so figure it out and take your sister I said ma we don't know Romanian and she said you don't need to know Romanian to take the bus walk two blocks that way, turn left, walk two blocks to the bus station, and then wait for bus, doi chasse opt, doi chasse opt, 268. And then get off at the central area and figure out which one is Calero Bantilor, and then follow that street for 15 minutes until you get to school. We've done it many times. I said, Ma, I'm scared. She said, when I was a little girl in, in India, I had to go to school by myself every day. You're 12 years old, take your sister and go. And I said, I'm scared. And she said, well, I guess you're not going to school today then. And my sister and I, we were at the top of our classes and we couldn't, con school was the only thing we had. We couldn't conceive of, of missing a day of school. So I took her hand <laughs> And I figured, we, f we made our way to the bus station and the buses were so crowded. They, they were bulging. People were hanging off the doors. So we just slipped in the crack and like sardines in a can. And we made it to the central part and we made it to school that day and every day after that by ourselves. My sister's elementary class started at a different time than my middle school class. And pretty soon she started going by herself. And I let her because I think I only had enough energy to survive on my own. I didn't have enough to help her survive. And so I left her alone. She was 10 years old. And I did that our whole lives. And I'm trying to change that now. My sister and I, for the first time, we had community. We had friends. We were at the top of our classes. We didn't want to leave, but we had to. We had to go back to Peru because my mom was getting a divorce. So my, we couldn't, when we went back to Peru, our house was going to be rented, so we were going to have to pay to stay at our friends. And my stepfather's driver begged my mom for our cat, for his daughter, because she lost hers. And my mom made him promise to love and take care of the cat. And so we moved back to Peru without, with a few suitcases and no cats. And in Peru, the school year is from March to December. So they were in the middle of their school year. And my mom's plan was to go to the American School of Lima and get us enrolled. So she went to the American School of Lima and the headmaster was on summer vacation and the school as soon as the school school counselor heard the word scholarships she dismissed my mom without a second thought my mom was expressing this frustration to a friend from the diplomatic world when the friend said what about San Silvestre San Silvestre was one of the top schools in Lima half Spanish half British and my mom said, what about San Silvestre? And she said, I can get you an interview. How? Because I'm an alumna and my daughter just graduated last year. Okay. And so we went for an interview at San Silvestre. And my mom didn't know this, but San Silvestre had a three-year waiting list for alumni kids. And every, uh, everyone else was at the bottom of that. But my sister and I wait in the lobby and my mom goes in to see the headmistress, Mrs. Bailey. And Mrs. Bailey says, what can I do for you? Please sit. And my mom says, no, I'm gonna stand. Don't let me waste your time. I don't have any money. But here are my kids' report cards. See what you can do for them. For the first time in the history of San Silvestre, two random girls got in in less than a week and the treasurer told my mom afterwards that Mrs. Bailey came out of her office, put her report cards on her desk and said, I don't care what you have to do. I want these two in my school. And they apologized for only being able to give us half scholarships. 
San Silvestre cost $550 per child per month. So my mom was going to have to pay $550 for both of us. And she made $600 a month. And my father's partial pension was $300. She didn't hesitate. So my sister and I put on our green and red plaid skirt, white shirt, and maroon moccasins, and we started another school. She went to sixth grade, to the last half of sixth grade, and my, the dean of students said he had full confidence that I could do the last half of eighth grade. I said, okay. So I went to the last half of eighth grade, and right away, there was this advanced algebra that I had never seen before. And I, I studied so many extra hours, I did hundreds and hundreds of extra problems to grasp it. And by the end of the year, I ranked 10th out of 117 girls. In Peru, at the end of the semester, they rank you and they post a list everywhere. And the Latino students were thrilled. And I went home and I said, Ma, I need to repeat eighth grade. And she said, what? But you're doing so well, why? And I said, because I don't understand math. I know that two plus two is four, but I don't know why. And if I'm ever gonna go to boarding school, then I need to have a foundation. By the way, when we were leaving Romania, my uh, mom went to thank the headmaster at the American School of Bucharest. And he said, I'm so sorry to see your daughters go. We love them. Is there any way you can stay? And she said, no. Um, I don't know the language, and I would have visa problems to get a job. At least in Peru, we have a house, we have a car, and I can get a job. He said, okay, well, I used to be an admissions counselor at one of the top New England boarding schools in America, and they look, like, they look for kids like yours. I and my mom, you know, you should consider it. And my mom thought, yeah, I have a million problems. And he took an envelope, a used envelope, and he wrote on the back of it the names of a bunch of boarding schools and gave the envelope to my mom, and my mom put it in her purse and forgot about it. So here I was and saying I needed to repeat eighth grade. And my mom says, okay. And she goes to the school, and the dean of students wants to choke her. Are you nuts? She's 10th out of 117 girls. You know how hard it is? She can't repeat. And my mom says, look, I'm going to listen to my daughter. She says she needs to repeat then. She's going to repeat. Can you stop her? No, he gritted his teeth. Good, she said. By the way, when I was five years old, I was supposed to go to kindergarten, but there was no space. So they put me in first grade. And I passed with something like a C plus. And the teacher was talking to my mom and she said, look, I, your daughter is bright. When she is able to focus, she does well. But she's five years old. She doesn't have the emotional maturity to focus for very long. I think she needs to repeat first grade. And my mom said, but she passed. And the teacher said, yeah, she passed. But if she goes on, it's like she's going to have a foundation of straw and trying to build, build a house with bricks. She's going to be trying to catch up for the rest of her life. So my mom said, okay. Okay, she can repeat first grade. And my father did not approve. Neither did his family, neither did society. But my mom held her ground. And so nine years later, I was going to repeat eighth grade. And to top it off for me, in the previous class, uh, the cool girls had taken an interest in me. And they introduced me to everybody, and they introduced me to a twin. And every time I saw this girl, I said, oh, are you twin X or are you twin Y? And that went on for months, and until one day one girl said, took pity on me, and she said, look, there's no twin. And every time you talk about it, everyone's laughing at you. I said, oh, nice. Kids can be really cruel. So after that, I, I spend most of my time in the library by myself, <laughs> reading books. And one day, 
I'm in the library and a bevy of girls assails me. And they said, have you seen the list? And I said, no, I didn't even know it was out. And they say, you, you have to see the list. And I said, okay, whatever. And they're like, no. And they dragged me to the list. And the last thing I expected to see was my name at the very top. I had ranked first out of 120 girls. And I did that the whole time I was there. And one day my mom comes home and I come out of my bedroom and I said, Ma, when are you going to do something about the boarding schools the headmaster wrote on that envelope? I've been here a year. I'm number one. And, I, and you're going to let me hear, you're going to let me rot for the rest of my life. And I slammed the door, teenager that I was. And the next day, my mom goes to work and she asks a colleague for, for help to use the internet because this was 1998 and she had never used the internet. So she researched all the boarding schools the headmaster had penned down in that envelope. And she wrote to three. One in California never wrote back. Cho Rosemary Hall in Connecticut wrote a polite response saying they didn't give international scholarships. And Deerfield Academy in Massachusetts said, we'll send you the paperwork at, at the right time. And my mom wrote back, what's the right time? <laughs> and they never replied to that. Uh, a couple of months later, we get a fat package from Deerfield Academy. And inside there is a VHS of life at Deerfield. And I ran to my bedroom and I put the VHS in the VCR and out comes this fantasy world of New England fall landscapes. Reds, browns, yellows, greens, and incredible colonial buildings and Deerfield athletes wearing green and white playing sports I had never seen. They had, they had a stick and a little net and a ball at the end because I had never seen lacrosse before. And fairy tale students wearing, boys wearing pastel colored shirts and ties and girls wearing spring pattern dresses and skirts. And it was a reality so far removed from mine, I thought I was watching a sci-fi movie. So my mom comes in and she says, I hope you have a favorite book. Because it says here you have to write an essay on your favorite book. And I want, I want a draft by this weekend. I said, okay. I wrote an essay on Anna Karenina. I have no idea what I understood at 14 years old about Anna Karenina. But I have a vague recollection of being fascinated by the choice she had to make between her son and the man she loved and that it ultimately cost her her life. The misery of Russian drama held a certain appeal for me back then. It doesn't anymore. Only God and the 1998 Deerfield Admissions Committee know what I wrote on that essay. So a couple of weeks later, my mom comes to me and she says, I spoke to the headmaster at the American School of Romania and he said that you have to do an in-person interview if we're asking for a full scholarship. Phone interview is not going to be enough. And I said, okay, but you don't have any money. <laughs> she said, a young IT tech at the foreign office is going to lend it to me. He's poorer than us, but he has his dream fund to go to Canada and I'm going to be able to pay him in two or three months. I said, okay. And my sister and I had never missed a day of school in our entire lives. She would, my mom would beg us to miss school when we were sick, but we didn't want to. We had nothing better to do and we didn't want to do double the work afterwards. So, but the next week I missed half a day of school to go to the center of Lima, a seedy, a seedy dangerous place to get my travel permit. See, in Peru, a minor needed dual parental permission. And since my father was dead, I needed the permission of the court. So we waited in line all afternoon from bureaucratic office to bureaucratic office, from line after line, until finally a judge stamped my passport. And I said, Ma, where's Deerfield Academy? And she said, well, they sent me a map of the east coast of the United States, and it looks like it's really close to New York. So I bought tickets to JFK Airport and... After that, we'll just take a bus and get there. I said, okay. 
and uh, she had $300 cash for this trip. So on the airplane right there, this lady sitting next to us strikes up a conversation and she says, do you have reservations at a hotel? And my mom says, no, I just figured we'd get it when we get there. And she said, you can't do that. It's peak fall season in New England. People come from all over the country to see the leaves at Deerfield. And my mom said, well, how can I get a reservation? And she said, when we land, you have to use your credit card. And my mom says, I don't have a credit card. So we land and this lady takes my mom by, by the arm to a phone booth and they start calling all the hotels in the list that Deerfield Academy had sent. And they're all booked. And the lady says, I think you need to call the school. So my mom calls the school and, they, and the secretary says, try Motel 6, it's not on the list. So she calls Motel 6 and they say, yeah, we can give you a reservation until midnight. And, but you have to pay in cash. My mom says, well, that's okay, that's all I have. So this lady makes the reservation with her own credit card and says, please don't charge this. They're gonna pay you cash when they get there. And we thank her and she takes her leave. And then we go to an information desk to figure out how to get to Deerfield Academy. And by the third information attendant, my mom is gonna have a stroke. She's got her map of the East Coast open and she's saying, look, look, it's so close to New York. I have to be able to get there. And they said, no, we don't know where Deerfield is. And then another attendant kind of comes, comes over and she says, ma'am, you need to go to Springfield, Massachusetts. It's the closest city to Deerfield. And from there you can take a bus. And my mom says, okay, well, how do I get to Springfield? You need to go to New York City and take a bus. And my mom says, but we are in New York City. She says, no, we're at the airport. You need to go to New York City proper to the Port Authority bus station and take a bus. My mom says, well, how do I get to Port Authority? Well, you need to take a shuttle from the airport, but you better hurry because shuttles don't run all night. So we ran to the shuttle and $10 each later, we get to Port Authority where it costs $55 each round trip ticket to get to Springfield. So we're down to $170 at this point for a $300 stash. And on the bus, it's pitch black. We get to New Haven and we're, we're really hungry. We haven't eaten all day. My mom begs the driver not to leave without her. And she comes back a few minutes later with two boxes of pizza. She says, here, have a slice. And I said, Ma, I'm not gonna eat unless you give some to the kids at the back of the bus because I can't eat. They must be hungry too. <laughs> she looks at me like, not happy. But she gets up and she offers pizza to everyone in the bus, including the bus driver. And then I eat. And then a little bit later, I say, Ma, do you know what you're doing? Of course I know what I'm doing, she snapped. When we get to Springfield, we're gonna take a cab to Motel 6. And the bus driver is overhearing this and he says, no, you're not. There's no way you're gonna get a cab at this time of night. And my mom says, well, what am I gonna do? And he says, I don't know, stay at the Marriott like everyone else. Didn't you plan this ahead of time? No, said my mom. Where I come from, people don't barely know where New York is, let alone Springfield and Deerfield, and we don't have money to stay at the Marriott. Well, he must have seen the expression of utter panic in her face through the rearview mirror, because a little bit later he said, look, when we get there, if you pay me $30, I'll take you to Motel 6, but you have to look for a cab first. My mom said, okay. So we get there and my mom and I are waiting in the deserted parking lot of the Springfield bus station with a neon sign behind us. And I'm thinking, waiting for the bus driver to come around and pick us up. And I'm thinking, oh my God, he could kill us and no one's gonna know, this is it. You know, he could be an expert or... But he pulls around in his pickup and 40 minutes later, he drops us off alive <laughs> at the Motel 6. So we go in. And my mom says, we have a reservation for a room. And 
The clerk says, Your reservation has expired. It was until midnight, and it is now 12.30. And my mom drops her bags, and she says, We have come from South America. We have been traveling all day to get to this godforsaken place. And no one, you hear me, and I guess we're going to have to to camp out on the porch because no one, no one is going to stop my daughter from going to her interview at Deerfield Academy tomorrow. And the clerk looks at her like shell-shocked. And he says, okay, ma'am, if you pay in cash, I can give you a room tonight, but tomorrow you're going to have to switch. I don't care what we have to do. So we get a room. And the next morning, my mom comes down at 10 a.m. to figure out a cab to get to Deerfield. And a new clerk says, you can't do that. And my mom says, why not? Because a cab's going to have to come out of Greenville to take you to Deerfield, and that's going to cost $40 there just for that. And I, my mom couldn't believe it. She was, she was going to cry. She didn't have the money. And the manager is listening, and the manager comes out of, of his office, and he says, Ma'am, what time is your interview? And my mom says, 2 p.m. And he says, I'll take you and your daughter. So the manager of the Motel 6 drives us to Deerfield. And as we, as we drive up to the main school building, it's this massive building with Greek columns and giant trees. And I meet with the head of admissions, Mrs. Gimbel. And while my mom is recounting our adventure to the, her administrative staff, and afterwards, we get this tour of the majestic grounds of the magnificent colonial buildings, the athletic fields, the library, the dorms. And the dream keeps growing inside of us. And maybe one day I'd walk alongside these fairy tale students. And Mrs. Gimbel's secretary takes us back to the Motel 6. And the next morning, the original clerk from Motel 6 gave us a ride to the Springfield bus station at 3 a.m. I still haven't read Tennessee Williams' play, A Streetcar Named Desire, but I have watched the film all about my mother more times than I can remember. And in that film, one of the main characters quotes the play, and she says, Siempre confiado en la bondad de los extraños. I have always trusted in the kindness of strangers. That's how I feel about our lives. So we went back to Peru, to our reality, and we didn't talk about Deerfield out loud anymore. I think we were afraid that the dream would vanish in a puff of smoke-filled yearning. And a few weeks after that, I, I popped myself on my mom's bed and I said, Ma, what if Deerfield only gives me half a scholarship, like San Silvestre? And she said, darling, Deerfield costs $40,000 a year. I make $600 a month, and your father's pension is $300. I didn't need to be a math genius to know that the dream of Deerfield was so far away, so impossible. One in a million, one in 10 million. And then on my 15th birthday, I was sitting in the library doing work on a computer when an email pops up and it says congratulations you have been accepted to Deerfield Academy with a full scholarship and when the carpool parent drops us, dropped us home I ran up the stairs I said ma ma I have this homework I need you to to see and she said now can I do it later and she was furiously sewing on her sewing machine and I said Okay, well, I'm going to leave it here, you know, and I put it right where she couldn't miss it, and she said, oh, okay. So she turns her sewing machine off, and she picks up the paper, and she bursts into tears, because our dream came true, because we didn't have a name that carried any weight anywhere. We didn't have money. All we had was my hard work and her tenacity 
and her vision. And it got me into one of the best schools in the world on a full scholarship. I cannot tell you how much I love my mother because she moved heaven and earth to give us the opportunity she never had. Because in spite of everything, she did her best. And that's all we can ever ask of our parents. And she believed in me. She's always believed in me. And she gave me the most precious gift a parent can give a child. She gave me the privilege to dream. And so the girl from Peru packed her bags and went to Deerfield Academy, 01342. And it was a fantastic experience in many ways, and it was a very challenging one in others. But I'm going to share two things that happened while I was in boarding school. When I was a freshman, I was very good friends with a junior boy. We were very close. I invited him to the Sadie Hawkins dance. He invited me to the prom. And by the time I was a sophomore, everybody wanted us to be together. So one evening, we're walking on Main Street. And I'm telling him about a girl in my basketball team that I was kind of obsessed with. And I was always talking about this girl. And he said, Olivia, it's okay if you're different. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not different. And the next day I kissed him and we officially started dating for two weeks. And for those two weeks, I avoided him. And then I broke up with him by phone. We didn't have texting back then. He didn't talk to me for years. But a week later, I walked by myself on Main Street and I collapsed on somebody's yard behind some bushes and I started sobbing because I couldn't deny it to myself anymore. I couldn't repress it. I realized I was gay and I looked up and I said, really? <laughs> Seriously? You've got to be kidding me. And it wasn't that I, that I thought something I couldn't control was wrong. But I knew my life was going to be so much harder now. I kn and it had already been hard. And I w wanted to know, why me? It took me a couple of months, but I managed to tell the assistant dean of students, who was the only person I knew who was gay and out. And she helped me tremendously. And I told the school counselor, who was my dorm parent, and she helped me too. But I was terrified of telling my mother, and I was terrified of anyone else finding out. When I was a freshman and I was trying to deny this to myself, I kept very busy so I wouldn't have to think about it. I was practically part of every group on campus. I was vice president of the freshman class. I was Miss Perfect, Miss Do-It-All. But by the time, by the end of my sophomore year came, the loneliness and the, the self-loathing were such that I thought of suicide more than once. And then I thought of my gay father dying in my mother's arms. And I couldn't do that to her. And I couldn't do that to his memory. My mother always said that he, he wanted to live so much that he had a thirst for life. That even in the end, he couldn't believe he was dying. And I was desperately trying to find a way to live the life he didn't get to live. And so I found a way to survive. The way I always had. Another thing that happened in boarding school was that I developed as an artist. I had the most wonderful mentor, Mr. England. God bless your soul wherever you are. He helped me to develop as a draftsman. He taught me how to paint. By the time I was a junior trying to figure out where to go to college, he said, I wanted to go to art school. And he said, Olivia, 
why don't you apply to Yale? They have a fantastic art program and I can write you a recommendation. I said maybe, but I was scared. I didn't do so well on my SATs. I didn't have tutors like my peers and I, I didn't know I could get books from the library and study. I had no idea. So it wasn't the best thing I've ever done. My college advisor said, you need to apply to liberal arts and Ivy Leagues. You're going to get a scholarship. And I said, no, I want to follow my heart and go to art school. I think for me, it was a form of rebellion. I had been in the closet for four years and going to art school promised freedom to be myself. But I didn't get any significant scholarships. I had to take out loans. And I didn't understand the burden of that decision and of that debt. My mom and I had no concept of finances. By, by then, she had moved to the state, she had remarried. And my third stepfather's concept of financial responsibility was credit cards. So I did not understand the choice I was making. And all I wanted when I was 19 was to be in art school, fall in love, and follow my dreams. All I had to do was become a famous artist. How hard was that? <laughs> so I applied to several art schools and I got into all of them and I decided to go to the best painting school, which I thought was Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA, in Baltimore. And I went to art school and two things happened. First, I went girl crazy. <laughs> I got my heart broken into a thousand pieces repeatedly. Back then, I didn't value who I was and what I had to give. I let people treat me in ways I didn't deserve because I was so needy. It took me many, many, many years to figure myself out and love. Art school was a very nourishing environment. It was very open. I went from colonial classrooms and a dress code to being in studios with 50 easels and critiquing artwork on the walls. And my loans covered tuition and housing, but nothing else. So not in our supplies, food, none of that. So I had to work to subsist. So I, I worked three jobs. I worked at the Career Development Center, I worked at the admissions office, and I worked as the campus security guard, <laughs> doing seven hour guard shifts at the different buildings. Now, I went to art school to paint, and I didn't so much as pick up a paintbrush. I picked up a, cam a video camera, and I fell in love with the medium, with the artistry, with the impact that it could have on people. But Micah's video program was very small. By the time I was a sophomore, I had exhausted the curriculum. I had taken every advanced class there was, and I had done over 30 shorts on my own, mostly experimental. And I knew that I was going nowhere in Baltimore in film, so I had to go to New York City. I had to go to film school. And I didn't want to go to just any film school. I wanted to go to the best. I wanted to go to Tisch at NYU. Never mind that it is the most ridiculously expensive school in the nation, and never mind that it was almost impossible to get in as a transfer. So I applied. But I was scared. I had a body of work in art school, I had a reputation, I had friends. But I knew my life and my work were stagnant, and that I had to move. And my mom, she called me every day to reassure me that I, what I was doing was right. And I got into Tisch, and I left to go to New York. Now, originally, when I had been applying to art schools, I didn't apply to art schools in the city because I was overwhelmed and scared by the thought of New York City. And now that I was there, I was still scared and overwhelmed. But one of my best friends from art school, she transferred to art school in New York City, too. And she was born and raised in Brooklyn. So the first day that I got there, she, she met me and she took me all over the city. We went to Central Park and watched a free Tia and Sarah performance. We, she took me on the subway. It took me three months to get on the subway by myself. Uh, I always did it with people. And she took me to the Tisch building and she said, this is where you have to go. And I said, thank you. 
it was summer and I had to do a film 101 class required for transfers. And that was the best time that I had in New York. We had to do five 16 millimeter films in four weeks, cut them on steam decks and everything. I hear they don't do film anymore, which is a shame. When I came back for the fall, the first day I went out to look for a job, I walked 50 blocks in sandals and two things happened. I got a job as a hostess at an Italian restaurant in Times Square. And I had, I, I realized you never walk 50 blocks in the city in sandals. <laughs> I couldn't walk for days for the blisters that I had. Now, film school was a completely different experience than art school. It wasn't nourishing at all. It was business. And in art school, people knew who I was. In film school, I was a number. And it didn't help that I was probably busier trying to survive. I had three jobs. Again, I worked at the Career Development Center. I, work, I worked at the Production uh, Center at Tisch. And I worked at the restaurant. So what I learned in film school was the business of filmmaking, was production producing. And what I learned that mattered to me was how to write screenplays. Now, they gave me a few guidelines, I read a book, and I mainly learned by doing it myself and writing on my own. I don't know that that was worth an extra $80,000 of debt, but I don't regret the choices I've made because then I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be who I am. And, of course, I wanted to write and direct. And things were going well. My favorite writing professor loved my final screenplay so much that she gave it to her own agent. Unfortunately for me, I didn't write just one, I wrote two period pieces, both expensive to make and difficult to sell. So. Her agent said she loved it, but that it wasn't for her. And then, the, and then the head of the department sent me to an agent, a renowned agent, I was told. And I think she was about 80 years old, and she shredded my script, and she shredded my shorts. Actually, that screenplay was a quarter finalist for the Nichols Fellowship, which is a prestigious fellowship, I think, run by the Academy. But not winning is not winning, so I had to figure out what to do. I didn't want to take an entry-level job in the film world. I didn't want to be slave away as a production assistant. I didn't want to be a, a lackey at a production company. I didn't want to get pigeonholed. A lot of times in filmmaking, whatever you start out as, is kind of what you stay. Like if you're starting out as an editor, editing, that's kind of what you do. It's very difficult to branch out. So I wanted to write, so I, and I, I needed a better paying job to stay in the city. So I decided I was going to bartend. <laughs> and I got a job at a, a great little bar called Key Bar in the East Village and owned by a wonderfully bald Hungarian. And um, the bar experience in itself is a story. <laughs> but I'll just tell you that I worked there for seven months and I didn't write one word. I was exhausted. I didn't see the light of day. I barely saw the sun. It was probably the most un the unhealthiest period of my life. I was still a vegan, I was starving. I was eating horrible processed wheat and soy and my acne came back really bad. I was trying to hide it with makeup and I couldn't hide it. And I also went to LA for a couple of weeks to see if I could figure it out there and I learned that I couldn't hack it there. I couldn't sell myself figuratively or literally. I couldn't shove my screenplay into people's faces and I couldn't beg for money. In New York, I had served hundreds of struggling artists, musicians, actors, writers, singers, and they were all gonna make it. And I was waiting for my moment, but I knew the way things were that it wasn't coming. So just when I was about to make 
the real money doing the weekend shifts, I quit the bar. By the way, I was, I don't drink. I was the only sober bartender in New York City for a while. <laughs> so I went to Peru for six months to write my breakout screenplay, of course. <laughs> and because I knew that I wouldn't have the opportunity to go back once I started working. And I hadn't been back for many, many years. But instead of writing, I fell in love. <laughs> I think I was escaping the reality that awaited me here. But I couldn't escape it forever. And when I came back, things were worse than when I left. This was 2008 and the economy was in shambles. My best friend from NYU went the animation track. He actually had marketable skills <laughs> and it took him a, a year to get a job. Everyone else we knew was temping random jobs till, till they got the one they wanted. And by temping, I mean they were working with a temporary work agency. And I was considering that. Meanwhile, to say that my mom's marriage was on the, rock, on the rocks was an understatement. So I went back home to support her, but truly she was supporting me and we were supporting each other. So a couple of weeks later, we left that house like fugitives and we stayed in her friend's basement. And I was tw 24 years old and I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was waiting for an offer from a friend from the bar to pan out. He said he was starting a, a finance app business and that I could do his website and graphic design, all these things. And my mom said, look, he's spinning you a tail. Okay, it's been months, that's going nowhere. And I said, Ma, what about my friend? She says she has a friend in New York that has a green cleaning company. And she said, I didn't send you to the best schools in the world so you can go clean toilets in New York. Okay. My life wasn't just a sinking ship. It had sunk. And I didn't know how. I was supposed to succeed. Instead, I was lost. I was stuck. And I didn't know how to fix it. So my mom comes home, comes to the basement one, one evening. And by the way, right now she is, she was doing boot camp to be a jail guard. <laughs> so she comes to the basement and she says, Olivia, I met all these reservists. You should join the army. And I said, what? I say, yeah, you can join the army and you can pay your loans. And I said, Ma, I'm an artist. And she said, I'll tell you what you are. You're 24 years old and you're nowhere. And you have $160,000 of debt and it's accruing every second. And if you don't do something about it, it's gonna crush you. And I was sobbing. I had never in my whole life considered the military. The academic world I had come from it was never even a consideration. Unfortunately, in many ways, it was looked upon with disdain. So it had never crossed my universe. And I felt like the walls around me were caving in. But the next day, I researched the army and I thought, okay, this doesn't sound so bad. They're gonna pay me to travel and I can pay my loans. And so my mom comes home and she says, Olivia, I met the Air Force Reservists. Forget the Army. You need to go to the Air Force. I said, Ma, I've been looking at the Army all day. And she said, well, look at the Air Force tomorrow. I said, okay. And that night I had a revelation. I was reading a Robert Ludlum novel, thriller, and I never read thrillers. My mom read Ludlum Grisham type thrillers. She never grew up with TV, so she said they were like her TV. But I had TV and I was used to reading literary fiction. I wasn't used to reading thrillers. I never had. But for whatever reason, I was reading this Ludlum. And I said, Ma, I can do this. This is just like a screenplay, only fleshed out. And she said, and I said, I can go to the Air Force, become an intel officer, and get material to write books. And she said, everything happens for a reason. And so the next day I researched the Air Force and I called the recruiter. 
and he said that I needed to be an American citizen to apply to be an officer. I said, okay, well, through serendipitous circumstances, my citizenship application process was in the works, and I had to wait about three more months. Meanwhile, we moved out of her friend's basement to a studio apartment in Springfield, Massachusetts, to be closer to, the job, to her jobs. The same place where a decade earlier, we had waited in a deserted bus station for a ticket to a dream. And now, 10 years later, we couldn't afford the rent with just her jobs. My mom had lost her job as a jail guard, and if you know my mom, <laughs> you know she was not meant to be a jail guard. And she worked as an interpreter for the Social Security Administration for the Office of Hearings, for the Office of Welfare Appeals. And I did that as well as a sub, you know, on a sub basis, but it wasn't enough. And I knew I had to find a job within walking distance because we only had one car and she needed it. And I couldn't just go to New York and get a job because I needed to be close to the recruiter so that I could do the administrative paperwork and the academic and medical testing. So on Thanksgiving, I go out, try to find a job in Main Street in Springfield. And right away, a cop stops me. He says, Miss, what are you doing? I said, Officer, I'm looking for a job. He says, Are you nuts? I wouldn't be caught dead letting my daughter walk these streets alone. You're like a sheep among the wolves. You need to go home. Thank you, Officer. And he left, and I knew I couldn't go home. I needed a job. <laughs> By the way, it's still 2008, and the economy economy's still in shambles. But lucky me, I spot a for hire sign next block over on a subway. And I walk in, and I, I talk to the owner, and I said, you know, I'm looking for a job. And he said, do you have a high school degree? I said, I have a bachelor's. He said, why are you looking for a job at subway? And I said, because I'm trying to join the Air Force and I need to be close to where we live and the recruiter's office. He said, look, come back after the holidays. I'm not hiring right now. So I came back after the holidays. And he said, I didn't think you were going to come back. And I said, are you going to give me this job? And he said, look, I'm going to have to hire somebody after you leave. But I'm going to give you the job because you were honest. Because I can see that you're going to work hard and you're going to be dependable. I said, thank you. And then January 28th, 2009 came. And that was the day I was to be sworn in as a citizen of the United States of America. In the beginning of the ceremony, the judge did something I'm sure she's done before and she will do again. She asked the enlisted military members that were in the front of the audience to stand up. And then she thanked them for their service and their sacrifice and for being willing to give their lives for a country that hadn't claimed them as theirs yet. But today that would change. I don't think there was a dry eye in the audience. And that's when it hit me. That's when I understood the, response, the weight of the responsibility of what I was about to do. I wasn't just making a desperate choice in a winding life path. I was giving back to a country that had given me opportunities that I would have never had elsewhere. And I had no idea what awaited me. And I was scared to death, but I was also proud and grateful for the opportunity to serve. And so I was sworn in as a, as a citizen of the United States of America. And the next day, I walked into the, recruiter, the Air Force recruiter's office in Springfield, Massachusetts. And the recruiter laid out my options. He said, we need to take advantage of your languages. You're fluent in Spanish, Portuguese, and some French. You need to take the DLAB, the Defense Language Aptitude Battery Test. Because you're going to dual apply. And if you don't get in as an officer, you're going to get in as enlisted and become a linguist. Now let me explain. To get a commission as an officer in the United States Air Force, you need two things. You need to be an American citizen and you need a bachelor's degree. 
to enlist in the United States Air Force, you don't need a bachelor's degree and you don't need citizenship. You can enlist right out of high school. So there are three avenues to becoming an officer. The first is to graduate from the Air Force Academy. Second is to go through ROTC, through college. And the third is to go to OTS, through officer training school, if you're coming in from the civilian world. And that's what I was trying to do. So he said, you need to take the ASVAB, the enlisted academic test. And you need to take the AFOQT, the Air Force Officers Qualifying Test. And by the way, the passing score for that, for the AFOQT, is very competitive for OTS candidates. You have to score much higher than what is required for Academy and ROTC grads. I said, okay. And he said, and half the test is math. Oh, great. My favorite subject. But the board is in September, so we have plenty of time to get your package ready. I said, okay. But this time, I knew I could study for the tests. So I bought books on the AFOQT and the ASVAB, and I studied day and night. And a week later, I went to the recruiter's office again, and I met with the head recruiter. And he said, I've been looking at your file. It's, you're a really strong candidate. There is a rated admissions board happening in March, and I think you should apply. I said, what's rated? And he said, it's the flying community. It's pilots, combat systems officers, slash navigators, slash electronic warfare officers, and air battle managers. They have wings. And I said, flying? But I want to be an intel officer so that I can get material for my books. And he said, there's no guarantee you're going to get an intel position. In fact, with your degree, you're probably going to get a, a public affairs position. It's a crapshoot. They really need air battle managers right now. And the important thing is to get in, right? Right. Oh, and you have to take the AFUKT in three weeks. Three weeks? I thought I had four months to study. Not for this board. So three weeks later, my mom drives me to Westover Reserve Air Force Base to take this test. And I take it with two engineers. And during the break, they're bragging about how easy it is. And I'm sweating bullets because the verbal section is putting the math section to shame. And I didn't even finish many of the math portions. But there's nothing I can do. All I could do was prepare the best I could, and I did. So a couple weeks later, the recruiter calls and he says, congratulations, you passed. And I said, thank God. Hey, what about those two engineers? Not even close. So the admissions process after that took a year. Meanwhile, I was working at Subway for seven months, and it was a difficult time. I went from being a, an artist to being a sandwich artist. <laughs> and a job is a job, and I was lucky to have it. But that didn't take the fact that I was 30 minutes away from my $200,000 boarding school. And I worked with a lump in my throat, hoping no one I knew would walk in. And then one day someone did. It wasn't a teacher or a former classmate, it was the production manager for the theater at Deerfield. And he knew who I was. He recognized me immediately. There are only 600 students at Deerfield. And I worked with his wife and her son, his son was in my sister's class. And not a word was said between us except what kind of footlong he wanted. And then he left. And then a new get girl got hired, and she had it out for me. She threatened to have her people beat me up. And my mom said, Olivia, you have to quit. What if they beat you up? What if, what if something worse happens? I said, Ma, we can't afford the rent. I need to work. I'll just look for another job. So I went around the corner to the Sheridan Hotel, and I got a job as a waitress for four or five months. And then the recruiter calls one day, and he says, Congratulations, you've been accepted into the Air Force as a combat systems officer slash navigator slash electronic warfare officer. And I said, but I didn't apply for that. And he said, your package was really strong. The board was really competitive. 800 people applied, 200 got in, and only 67 positions were rated. I said, great, I guess I'll go find out what a combat systems officer slash navigator slash electronic officer does. Now what? <laughs> 
He said, now you go to officer training school, AKA boot camp. And so I packed my bags and I headed to Montgomery, Alabama to Maxwell Air Force Base for OTS. And my traveling companion was a girl from the area that was also doing OTS. And we had missed our connecting flight and we were late. We were the last two to arrive to the OTS complex. And we're outside the fence and one of the upperclassmen officer trainees, OTs, meet, meets us there and he says, do you have any questions? Because once you cross that fence, it's game time. And we didn't have any questions. <laughs> and then he says, what do you expect? And I look at my companion and I say, and I, and I think, oh my God, don't say anything. Please don't say anything. And it was like watching a train wreck in slow motion. <laughs> and she smiles big and she says, I think it's gonna be fun. And his jaw drops. And I close my eyes and I said, oh Lord, oh Lord. And we cross the threshold. And the OT says to his 30 buddies, hey guys, Guess what? These, these girls think this is gonna be fun. <laughs> and the 30 OTs who might have otherwise gone easy on us because we were late and we were the last two, swarmed in on us. And one got an inch from my face and started screaming to the top of his lungs and his spit was hitting my face. I think I lost some of my hearing that day. The next 30 minutes were a blur of screams and everything was a shock to me. Everything after that was a shock. The purpose of OTS is to break you and to build you back up. But the first half of training is the break you, hazing, fun fest part. I won't go into details, but I'll share one thing. A week later, we were outside the dining hall after a five minute hazing lunch. We were lined up in flights in formation, reciting quotes of the day. We had this little Bible book called the Hawk that had the rules, it had the Airman's Creed, it had quotes of the day, it had a lot of information that we were expected to know. So we were getting yelled at, reciting this quotes of the day, and one of the flight commanders starts circling our flight like a shark. And he stops in front of me, and he says, O.T. Ketker, step forward. And I step forward. And he yells, do you think you deserve to be an officer in the United States Air Force? And I said, yes, sir. And he screams, louder. I can't hear you. And I said, yes, sir. I don't think so. You're weak. I can see it in your eyes. You don't have what it takes. Why don't you do us all a favor and you quit? Why don't you DOR? D-O-R stood for drop on request. It meant I quit. If you so much as uttered those words out loud in front of leadership, you were done. It was over. You were marched out of the OTS complex. There was no second chances. There were no do-overs. There was no oops, I'm sorry. It was game over. So he's screaming in my face. You don't have what it takes. You won't even last a week. You won't even last a day. And I choked back my tears. And I looked somewhere on the horizon and I focused my gaze somewhere else until he left. And my flight was deathly silent. And this female upper class OT approaches, OT Hewlett, and she says, OT Ketker, come with me. And she takes me to the bathroom and she says, I am so sorry. I have never seen a flight commander be so vicious with an OT before. And I said, why are you doing this? And tears were streaming down my face. And she said, because someone did f this for me. And because I know you can do it. I can see that in your eyes. And I looked at her and I wiped my tears. And I said, these people don't know me. They have no idea who I am. They have no idea what I've been through. 
and I'm never gonna shed a tear in front of them, and I'm never gonna give up, and I'm never gonna quit. And she said, I believe you. And three months later, a day before graduation, the flight commanders took us to the officers club as per tradition. And my flight commander got drunk and he said, Ketker, Ketker, come here. I said, yes, sir. You know that movie, that film, The Shawshank Redemption? And I said, yes, sir, it's one of the greatest films ever made. Of course I know it. He said, remember that part in the beginning when the new inmates come in and they're lining up and the old inmates are sizing them up and trying to take, taking bets on who is going to crack that night? I said, yes, sir. He said, we do that too. We take bets on the new OTs and to who is going to crack, who is going to break, who is going to cry first, who is going to DOR first. And a lot of the flight commanders bet on you. But you effing kicked butt and you showed them all. And I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I did. And the next day I got commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force. And after that, I went to aviation training for a year. I'm not a pilot. I was trained as a combat systems officer slash navigator slash electronic warfare officer. And I chose to be an electronic warfare officer. Now, by the time you watch this video, I will be an eight year veteran. But right now, I am still a mission crew commander for one of the most dynamic and crucial ISR platforms in the nation. ISR stands for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. I'm at the back of the plane, and I'm in charge of the management and safety of 15 to 20 crew members, and I'm directly responsible for making sure that we successfully accomplish our, our higher headquarters missions. So, after aviation training, I went to through a variety of survival trainings that challenged me physically and mentally more than anything else I've done. I went to SEER, Survival, Evasion, Resistance and Escape School, in the mountains of Washington in the dead of winter, hiking with a pack almost as heavy as me with broken snowshoes. I have no idea how, how I got through that. I think if it weren't for my flight, for the people that were doing the field portion with me, I wouldn't have gotten out of there in one piece. And then I did water survival, two kinds, parachute and non-parachute. I got dangled off a boat, off a ship, okay, dropped and dragged to simulate getting dragged by a parachute. I got left in the middle of the ocean by myself for a few hours in a one-man life raft to simulate being lost at sea. I got put in a fake fuselage and submerged under a pool to simulate crashing in the ocean. I did that and so much more. In my whole life, I never imagined I would have gotten to do some of the things I've done and seen some of the things I've seen. In joining the Air Force, I was trying to put my life back together and I was saying thank you to a nation I love. And as I jumped into the abyss of the unknown, it changed my life. And I'll share with you three big picture changes that happened. The first is that $160,000 crippling loan I had. Now 145,000 of that was a parent loan at 8% interest. 40,000 of that was interest alone that was still accruing. The rest were small potato personal loans in comparison. 8,000, 6,000, 4,000, 500, 2,000. I kept the $2,000 one around. It was 1% interest and I kept it to build credit. And I put at least half my paycheck every month and I paid every cent off in five years and I taught myself <laughs> about finances and about financial planning because I never wanted to make another uninformed choice again when it came to money 
And if you want to know more about that, you can watch my financial planning video. The second important thing that happened. When I told you that when, after film school, I didn't really write anything. <laughs> and part of the reason I went to the Air Force was so that I could get material for my books. And I thought after three or four years, I'll be stable enough that I'll be able to write. Well, the shock of joining the military, period, and the fact that I had to go back into the closet because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, were a lot more difficult than I, than I had expected. And it jolted my heart like a defibrillator. And I started writing a week before my aviation training. And I haven't stopped for seven years. I did a master's in intelligence studies with a concentration in criminal intelligence. And I did that because at the time it was a requirement for promotion in the Air Force. But I picked that one because I thought it would be something I would enjoy, it would be exciting, and it would inform my writing. And because of that master's, I have ideas for the next 20 years, including three and a half drafts of the four and a half drafts of books I've already written. The third and most important thing that happened to me in the Air Force and in my life. So I was fully aware when I went in that the Don't Ask Don't Tell was in place and I thought I was going to be alone for eight years. I mean, if I didn't meet the right person in art school and film school, what were the chances I was going to meet someone in the military under those circumstances? Well, I did. I met the love of my life and we've been together for six years and we've been married for four and a half and it just keeps getting better and better <laughs> because as I grow and she grows we grow together as a couple and it adds another layer of understanding and depth to our relationship one of my favorite things that Stephen Covey wrote Stephen Covey wrote the fantastic book seven habits of highly effective people and if you want to know more about that, you can watch my seven habits video. But he said that love is a verb. And what he meant was that if you're going to say you're in love, if you're going to be in love, you have to actively love. And if you want to know more about that, you can watch my love and relationships video. And here I am, eight years after joining the Air Force, ready for the next stage of my life and to achieve the rest of my dreams. So that was the Cliff Notes version of my life. <laughs> Everyone has a story. And while that story shapes who you are, it doesn't have to define you. You take the good and you run with it. And you take the bad and you turn it around to become the best version of yourself, the truest expression of your soul. There is nothing stopping you from spreading your wings. And if there is, you can figure it out, you can work with it, and you can shine. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it, and consider subscribing so you can get the latest Happy Now video every week. I'd also love to hear in the comments below how your story has shaped who you are. Remember, happiness is an active choice. You don't have to wait. You too can be happy now. Thanks for watching. See you next time.